The Fred and Dinah Gretsch School of Music at Georgia Southern University welcomes you to the Carol A. Carter Recital Hall. As a courtesy to the performers and to your fellow patrons, we ask that you please turn your electronic devices off at this time and put them safely away. Flash photography is not permitted in the hall, as it can be disorienting or even dangerous for the musicians. And for legal reasons related to intellectual property rights, personal recording devices may not be used during the event. We appreciate your help in making the Carter Recital Hall a pleasant place to experience great music, and we hope that you enjoy this performance.
when your students are so excited to perform that they don't even wait for you to come out and into the room. <laughs> just, just by God, just got, got the music in me, got to get it out. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming, and I'll send these people out there for the other seat. Um, thank you for coming out and supporting live music. If you've been to one of our concerts before, you realize I talk in between everything. Just to give you a little information about the pieces we're performing, um, and also to kind of stall while we do some of our set changes. Uh, there were far more set changes once we went through the dress rehearsal last night. There was a lot more set changes than I anticipated. Um, the first piece, uh, Fanfare for Tambourines, was published in 1989. And the tambourine is an instrument that's been around uh, for a really, really long time in one form or other. Uh, the piece was written to utilize the many different sounds that you can get out of the instrument. Um, and in this case, tambourine is actually used as uh, a melodic instrument, which never happens in uh, the orchestral or band world, it seems like. Um, the, next, the next piece we're going to perform is Tusk. Um, it is a four movement piece, and the movements kind of just go one into the next. It was published in 2001, and it's a, a programmatic piece, meaning it tells a story. So this particular story is set in Africa, um, and it employs, employs many traditional African instruments, uh, such as you'll see bull roars, kabasa, sometimes called a piche, xylophone, spigani, John Kokui, and mbira, which is, uh, you might know as a kalimba, it's like a thumb piano type instrument. Um, the uh, the idea that it, uh, the idea that inspired the story for this work is as follows, and I'm, this is from the score. Uh, beginning in the late the late 70s, the price of ivory on the black market had risen to as much as $150 a kilo, causing violence to spread to many parts of Africa. During the 1980s, uh, greedy poachers hunted throughout the African fields, slaughtering nearly 80 percent of the elephant population. The annihilation of close to a million of these creatures put them on the endangered species list. And he goes on to describe the way that some of this um, ivory was harvested and it's really kind of brutal and I've decided I was gonna scratch that out because it's pretty horrible. Uh, the, the music of Tusk draws on every aspect of African music. The instruments are direct descendants from the African culture and the piece has four distinct parts, and if you look in your program, if you can see it, um, the African Dawn, the Nigo Dance, the Hunt, and the Killing Fields. Tusk.
Several years ago, I played that piece, and I decided I'd program it at the end of the concert uh, because it's like, what can you do after that, right? And it's like, oh man, it's heavy. And everybody's like, <laughs> everybody's so it's such a downer. It's like, well, maybe we'll open it at the end, you know? Maybe we'll end with a bang. Um, so our next piece is kind of interesting. And I programmed it right after Tusk on purpose. Um, after Stuba, what does that even mean? 
Well, that was written, uh, the piece is written by Mark Ford. It was premiered um, at PASIC, the Percussive Arts Society International Convention in the fall of 2000, and Mark Ford and Christopher Dean and someone else played on it, I can't recall. Um, and it was written as a sequel to Ford's composition, Stubernick. And like Stubernick, it features three people playing on one marimba. Um, and at some point, all three players play on every register of the marimba at some point during the piece. So the goal of the composer was to combine quality music with a little bit of fun to celebrate the potential of the marimba, the potential of the marimba. And you'll see um, as the piece unfolds that they pretty much play the whole entire thing. Um, it features a number of meter changes. There's a great deal of melodic imitation in the piece and there's quite a lot of contrapuntal writing. There's a lot of stuff going on at one time and a certain amount of jockeying for position behind the marimba, as you can imagine, with three people trying to uh, get to their notes. Um, it's been a lot of fun for these fellows to work this up. They spent um, a decent amount of time actually having sectionals and stuff on it, because it's a fistful of notes. Um, so I think they're about ready. So we hope you enjoy At The Stuba. Thank you. 
A lot of notes, a lot of notes. Um, we've got a decent amount of set change going on here for this next piece. So I want to tell you a little bit about, if you're not familiar with uh, Candide, um, Candide's written by Leonard Bernstein, the same person who wrote the music for West Side Story. Um, and Candide is actually an operetta. We're not playing the entire operetta, or, or, nor are we going to act it out. Um, it's an operetta in the vein of Gilbert and Sullivan, so it's a comic opera. And typically comic operas don't always have overtures. Um, but this, this particular one did. Um, it was Bernstein's third Broadway musical and premiered in 1956. Um, the, operetta, the operetta was not initially very popular. It, it closed after only 73 performances and it went through some revisions over the years. Um, but the overture has become a very popular band slash orchestral piece. Um, like most overtures, it contains a lot of the themes that you would hear in the performance of the operetta itself. Um, and if you're familiar at all with Bernstein's music, he really likes to manipulate time, so it kind of makes it difficult to feel where the downbeat is, and this can be challenging uh, to play and kind of keep up with. Um, I've had the opportunity of performing different parts, like percussion parts, um, in the overture with orchestras that I've played in over the years. And it's always a ton of fun to play. I just love the piece so much. Um, and it's always challenging to play because of the twists and turns that he puts in there. Um, I like it so much that back in my marching band directing days, I actually programmed it on the field. Um, and if you're familiar with the, the overture itself, rest assured we did not take it at the breakneck tempo. <laughs> that you hear, uh, well not with all the feet involved and 200 people on the field trying to do it. Um, I was fascinated uh, when I, the first time I saw Amadeus, I was fascinated with the, with the idea of having a court composer, just having somebody uh, who's always around saying, you know, write, write some music for me, I need, need some music. That's before obviously radios and all that kind of stuff way back in the day, um, Mozart's time. And um, I've been fortunate enough to have somewhat of a court composer uh, myself. Uh, my friend, and who, uh, who for years taught at uh, the Armstrong Campus Call Percussion, Steve Formatic, um, he and I have known each other for a long time and he, he constantly is, is writing. We played we play one of his pieces with five people on marimba at our last concert in the spring and there was no bloodshed, but it was pretty close. Um, and he arranges stuff like, all the time, you know, he can just pop them out. So I feel like I've got kind of a court composer because um, Steve was um, arranged this and um, I don't know that it's gonna be published because it's because of the publishing rights, but he arranged this and said, hey man, you wanna play this? I said, absolutely, because I like the piece, I like the way he arranges. And it just so happens that it fit our ensemble. So we're gonna perform for you now the overture to Candide.
So we have a little more set changing to do for our next piece. Is uh, Dr. Chromatic in the house tonight? He hates it when I call him out, but uh, nice job. How about the arrangement? <laughs> Literally, it's like, hey man, I got to go to the restroom. I'll be right back. And he comes back, hey, I, I did another arrangement. <laughs> um, the next piece we're going to perform is Concerto for Concerto Number no. One for Vibraphone by Ney Rosaro, and we're performing the first movement of this. Um, 
It was composed by Ney in 1995, and it was originally written for vibraphone and chamber orchestra. The Percussion Ensemble Arrangement was published one year later in 1996, um, and dedicated to the well-known percussionist Evelyn Glenny. Uh, you might have heard of her, if not look her up. She's a fantastic percussionist all around, percussionist. Um, we've been fortunate enough to have Nay here uh, at, at Georgia Southern a few times. Nay and I went to school together in, uh, at the University of Miami, and as well as Steve from Attic, and that's where we all three met. We were actually in a graduate percussion ensemble together, and that was a, a load of fun. Um, so Nay has been here a few times, uh, at least twice that I know of. Uh, the second time he came, we performed his Vibraphone Concerto Number no. Two uh, for Vibes and Percussion Ensemble. It was actually the United States premiere of that piece here on this stage with Nay, and um, made a YouTube video of it, several cameras and stuff like that. Um, so it's out there on the Vic Firth website. You can check that out if you want. Um, that was in 2016, so it's been a few years ago. Um, this piece is largely in 7-8. Uh, the first movement performed this evening, Recitativo Allegro, develops from a chromatic theme, first presented at a slow tempo in the very uh, beginning, the beginning measures of the piece. It utilizes scales that are often found in Brazilian folk music. And if you're familiar with Neyrozaro's music in general, he's, he's somewhat of a romantic composer. He's not really into the blue bleak, you know, uh, funky contemporary sounding music. Um, that's just what he likes to do. And a lot of his music kind of has this folk music element about it. I think that's why people really took to it when he came on the scene. Um, tonight we are fortunate to have Mr. Ty Kundi playing the uh, solo part for the first movement of Vibraphone Concerto Number no. 1 by Ney Rosaro. So you guys sit. I'll let you take it away.
So we have uh, one last piece to play tonight, and I want to take the opportunity before I tell you about it uh, to thank you again for coming out to see live music. Um, live streaming is awesome, and you know I've got some buddies in Atlanta, and I sent them the link, and if they're not watching it, they're going to be in trouble. But it's not always possible for people to to get to a performance physically and to show up, especially in the middle of the week. Um, and I was kind of worried when the pandemic hit and everybody kind of ran to their own corners, if that was going to be the norm and everybody just stayed home, I'll just watch it live stream. So um, as you could probably tell, though, it's a lot different experience, actually, being in the room where it, when it's happening. So I'm so happy that, um, you know, this is kind of picking back up and people are starting to crawl out from under the rocks of COVID and come out to concerts again. So it's really a joy to play for people instead of only cameras. But those of you who are watching the live stream, I very much appreciate you tuning in. Um, and, and the cool thing is it can get to people that probably couldn't make it down here. So um, anyway, enough of that. Um, our last piece, it's called Sinister Minister by Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Um, and I remember the first time I heard Bela Fleck's music, I was like, what is this? You know, that's not, the, he plays banjo, right? And that's not how banjo is supposed to sound. You're supposed to have like grass in your teeth and sitting on the back of the truck and playing, you know, bluegrass. Um, but if you've never heard Bela Fleck's music, you should check it out. It's, it's um, very eye-opening. So he plays kind of jazz, uh, fusion, banjo, um, and he's got quite a lineup with him. Um, so it's Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones, which is a pretty cool name in and of itself. Um, so the, a lot of the material that, that they play is, he does play some things that sound like straight up bluegrass, but there's a lot of fusion and post-pop music. Um, they, the group formed in 1998, and the core group was Bela Fleck playing banjo, Victor Wooten playing bass guitar, who is just a monster bass guitar player, and his brother, Future Man, who plays this drum tar kind of thing. He plays some acoustic percussion too, but he plays uh, this thing that has all these little sensors on it, the snare drum and bass drum and triangle and all this stuff that he invented. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Howard Levy played harmonica and keyboard, at least at one time with him, and Jeff Coughlin playing saxophone. Um, they've put together some albums where um, he brought in a lot of other people as well, um, additional musicians. They have this one album in particular called Outbound, um, where he's brought in some extra woodwind players, and there's a guy standing up playing a bassoon to a wah-wah pedal, and that's a really a freaky thing to hear. Um, he also brought in a toddler player, someone playing steel drums, and even an Indian throat singer, and that's always interesting to hear too. Um, Sinister Minister was released on their first album called Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Um, and this particular percussion ensemble arrangement was done by David Steinquest. Um, there was a terrible omission in the program, just trying to get it out on time. And we have a guest um, joining us tonight on bass guitar, Mr. Josh Upchurch. So give it up for Josh Upchurch. <laughs> Also, you know, the majority of people in the percussion ensemble are music majors, but not all of them. Um, so it, at some point, they kind of have to move on. Um, we have a lot of music ed majors, and at some point, they have to leave our campus and go student teach and go out in the world and shape young minds. So next semester will be Ty Cundy's semester to go out and student teach. So this is his last percussion ensemble concert. So let's give it up for Ty. So we're going to end with a little toe tapper called Sinister Minister. Once again, thank you so much for coming out.
Tide Hunting t-shirts in the lobby. <laughs>